This is where it starts to get tricky, all right, because the way IPv6 was designed is that there's no outside WAN interface. Everybody has a global address. Is everybody doing that at the moment? I'm not sure because from some of the people that I've talked to that are in service provider roles, um, the people that are doing some IPv6, correct. When we, so the question was, does that mean we have no NAT? Correct. So the whole purpose of IPv6 is to remove NAT. Now is, are there companies that are actually deploying it like that? Yes and no. I personally think that how most organizations are doing it now and how we're going to continue to do it is that organizations want to keep their IPv4 addresses natted and we're going to be dual stacked and then we're just going to do IPv6 from the outside router to the service provider. Now, is that how it was designed? No, but do people really want global addresses on their hosts in their corporate environment? Probably not. Now, it's one thing if it's a mobile device, all right? A lot of corporations that are moving to IPv6 are doing IPv6 on mobile devices, and that's fine if any of you guys have T-Mobile. I don't know if you're if you've ever looked, depending on where you live, um, what type of address you have when you're going over your LTE or 4G or whatever, um, a lot of times you'll have an IPv6 address, all right? Um, but basically, you know, IPv6 networking is already up and running. Google's been doing it, Facebook's been doing it, um, and there's a lot of vendors that have an IPv6 enabled cloud but for those that don't, the providers can just do tunneling. All right, now tunneling's outside of the scope of this class, but um, yeah, Jimmy says, doesn't it make it a lot less secure? It's not that it's a lot less secure, it's just they haven't ironed out the wrinkles with IPv6. And um, I personally think a lot of organizations are dragging their feet moving to IPv6 because there are a ton of vulnerabilities and I think the hackers are gonna have a heyday when V6 really does start getting rolled out. So I don't know. I'm part of that tinfoil hat club, so I, you know, am I always have a healthy level of paranoia going on with any new technology. But um, that's what we kind of need to know at the moment as far as the difference between our global and link locals. Now, when I do show IPv6 in brief. You guys saw me just configure this 2001 address. All right, I actually entered a couple zeros in there and it took it out for me. It automatically abbreviated for me. And then it also automatically created an FE80. Now, um, really quick, we're gonna talk about this concept of stateless address auto configuration. One mechanism that stateless address auto configuration uses is this EUI64 where we automatically populate the 64 bits using a MAC address, all right? Take the first 24 bits of the MAC, the last 24 bits of the MAC, right? That's 48 bits. We add F, 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 E. And when we add that together, it gets us to 64 bits. Now, um, you and Ryan, yes, we both do. <laughs> Probably me more so than him. Um, but with the mechanism that Cisco uses to create their link local, it's actually using the same EUI64 that stateless address auto configuration uses, all right? Now, even though stateless address auto configuration is one of the three options we can use for address assignment for IPv6, the thing that kind of gets a little fuzzy here, and not that you guys need to know this for the exam, but in real world, if we enabled our Cisco routers to do Slack, what happens is the router says, hey, I'm gonna give you my network portion, all right? 
which in this case was 2001 ABC 7891, right? So that's my network portion. He basically starts handing it out to all the end users in VLAN 10, right? Or whatever VLAN this is. Now these end users could, if they wanted to, use EUI 64, but it's also gonna depend on the OS. A lot of operating systems got heat for using EUI 64 because who wants their MAC address associated with their global routed address? I sure don't. Obviously our government had a big part in developing IPv6 and what does our government love to do? Spy, right? So if they can track everybody's MAC address to whatever they're doing globally online, it can make tracking people a lot easier, assuming that people don't know how to cover their tracks. But that was like, mm, I don't know, like six, seven, eight years ago when everybody was up in arms about that EUI 64. So what happened is companies like Apple and companies like Microsoft said, our customers aren't happy with this whole EUI 64 thing. So we actually have this new randomize, randomizing, I'm not even gonna try to spell that right now. <laughs> I'm just gonna butcher it. All right, but anyway, uh, they can take some algorithm and randomize your host portion of your address. All right, that's all you guys really kind of need to know. And that's, you know, you don't even need to know it for the exam, it's just for real world. It's a false sense of security. It makes us feel better about our purchases and our vendors, but we all know that Apple and Microsoft are also in cahoots with our government, right? <laughs> all right, all right, I won't go down that tangent. A um, Couple other things that um, I just wanna let you guys know is when we get to our route class and when we start talking more about this whole FE80 address, um, Using the EUI 64 method is sometimes gonna make it difficult to be able to later identify, right? If I log into R3 and I'm like, hey, R3, what's your next hop IP? He's gonna use the EUI 64, the FE80 address. And it's gonna be really hard to determine what that address is. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll say, instead of using that address, we'll do an IPv6 address FE80, 80, and then um, instead of using the C801 blah, 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 I can do the ABC7891 portion. So my first block might not match, but my second, third, and fourth block match. And then let's give him a colon, colon, one, just like we did that global address and then I'm gonna give this the association of link local. And now when I do show IPv6 int brief, now those FE80s and global addresses look a lot alike. So now I'm already getting acclimated with my topology. I know that you know my link between you know R1 and that subnet is the ABC789. And I know this prefix between R1 and R3 is the 2001-12345. I might make that an FE80-12345 prefix as well. That's just gonna make the overall correlation in our routing tables, our OSPF neighbor adjacency tables, all that look a lot easier on the eyes. All right, so just, are you guys feeling a little bit better about FE80 in 2001? FE80 a lot of times is just used for internal stuff, any ICMP, IGMP stuff. Um, it's sometimes used for neighbor discovery, router advertisements, all that stuff. Um, whereas uh, things like the 2001 is just to get outside of our subnet. All right, so stainless address auto configuration is something that we can enable on our routed interfaces or our switch virtual interfaces. And basically what this does is it starts sending out these messages 
to users within our um, VLAN. And it basically says, hey, for those of you guys that were trying to look for a DHCP server, I already have a subnet or a network configured on my routed interface. Why don't you guys go ahead and use that and I'll be your default gateway. Now, of course, the downfall to this is that we aren't going to be providing DNS information. We aren't going to be providing domain information like we normally would with DHCP. So we could always tack on some additional configuration with the DHCP light to um, just complement stateless address auto configuration. So the router advertisement gets sent or a router solicitation get sent, whichever one comes first, the router is just going to respond either with a router advertisement and usually that router solicitation comes first because those router advertisements aren't sent very frequently. So how do we actually set this up either on a routed interface or on a switch virtual interface? We use the IPv6 address command. We put the address on it. We do a no shut. And on our layer three switches, no additional commands are necessary. A lot of times if we are on um, a routed interface, we might need an additional config. At the moment, you guys don't need to know what that is. Now we should also be familiar with the four step process. Instead of Dora, we're gonna have the solicit, the advertise, the request, and the confirm. So the client initializes with the solicit. Now we don't have broadcasts anymore with IPv6, but we do have this thing called an all nodes multicast. Kind of sounds like a broadcast in a fancier term, right? We're talking to everybody in our subnet, all nodes, but we're just using multicast. All right, the server then replies with an advertise. Hey, here's an address. The client is then going to select an address with a request. I'd like to utilize this address. And then the server is just going to finalize the process with a confirm. All right, what else? Um, as far as DHCP for V6, um, I think you know, looking at the clock and just looking at where we're at, it seems like we've already been kind of flooding you guys with a lot of information. So why don't I leave you guys off here for today, give you the opportunity to kind of digest the global, the link local, um, the stateless address auto configuration, the UI64, and then tomorrow what we'll do is we'll pick up on some more DHCP We'll talk a little bit about how this works. I have a routed topology that we can kind of use to demonstrate how this works. The commands are slightly different on a routed interface versus a switch virtual interface, but for the most part, it's all pretty much the same. So we'll pick up here tomorrow. We'll look at the, um, the demo that I have. And then, you know, of course, if you guys have any other questions, you can let me know. All right, sometimes just, you know, running through the labs too is going to help some of this soak in. So maybe practice in the labs after class. Um, have a good rest of your afternoon and we'll see you tomorrow. The RA is the router advertisement. And let's see, we, hmm, it's a, uh, it's a IGMP type message. Um, let's see what else. The router advertisement can automatically be sent. I think it's sent like every minute from a router, but usually the router solicitation happens first. It's like, hey, is there a router out there running IPv6? And then the router advertisement is just a response to the solicitation. No problem.